have the honor to present today's keynote speaker, Erik Norin. Erik Norin is a Swedish architect and an entrepreneur, educated at the Swedish Royal Institute of Technology, as well as at the French, and I'm not going to try to pronounce this school's name in French, so I'm just going to say National School of Architecture in France. Norin is uh, CEO of Traditions Architects and is the co-founder and vice president of the Architect Rebellion for Traditional Architects and aesthetics. Let's welcome him up. Thank you for this very nice introduction. It's probably the most professional introduction I've ever had. I had to think myself, did I actually do those things? But yes, <laughs> thanks. First of all, dear friends, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, very nice to be here. Thanks for listening to what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about what's closest to my heart and a subject I hope is equally important and beautiful to you as to me. And that topic is, of course, architecture. So my name is Erik Norin, as it says there, very important. This is my business card to all of you. <laughs> and um, as an architect, I feel it's almost a duty or an obligation to inform you that today, this very day today, is important because today in almost 40 minutes it's exactly 100 years ago the inauguration party of Stockholm City Hall and to me this is the best piece of architecture this country can offer this is the best building in this country according to me and I would argue that if you take the soul of Stockholm what Stockholm is what Sweden is to some extent, and the history of the place, and you put that together in a beautiful marriage with classical architecture components, you get this. Swedish grace, Scandinavian classicism. And this is the building where they hand out the Nobel, Peace, uh, the Nobel Prizes, not the Peace Prize, that's handed out in Oslo, but the Nobel Prize ceremony is held in this building. It says something. This building is a symbol of Sweden. When Ragnar Usberg designed this building, he studied the history of Stockholm. The reason you see those three crowns up there, it's not because we're supporting the national ice hockey team. <laughs> it's because the old castle in Stockholm was named Tre Kronor, Three Crowns. And the legend says that in the fire in the 1600s, when that castle was destroyed, had a tower with those three crowns. So his idea was to give a blink to history and reinstate that in a Stockholm context. Also, they did some archaeology uh, work in the 1920s and found the original bricks from that castle. So he ordered the new bricks produced for this building to be made with the same dimensions. So this is, to some extent, the core of Swedish and Stockholm architecture. This is a picture from the inauguration. And on Lake Mälaren, the one we have just outside the window here, they had, in true Viking tradition, a sailboat race, a regatta, and that's what's going to happen today and also tomorrow. So if any of you leaves this conference tomorrow by bus or by train or by car and you happen to pass by Stockholm Central Station, this is a five minute walk. So I would highly recommend you visit, in my eyes, the best building Sweden has to offer. And it's open, free for all, and there will be a sailing contest with the same boats they had in the 1920s. I'm just going to turn this, sorry. So th that's a little tip from, uh, from me to all of you. To, to some extent, what these people did 100 years ago, in my eyes, they gave us a gift. This building is a gift to all of us, to everyone who's visiting, everyone who's seeing, and it's a symbol for us. And talking about city halls and gifts, this is the new city hall in Växjö. <laughs> I, I hear most of you are laughing. I'm not laughing, I'm almost crying. Because if this was a gift to us, from people who lived 100 years ago, is this our gift to our grandchildren? So one thing that makes me even sadder is when this project was sold to the people of Växjö and to the politicians of Växjö, they were shown this picture. This is what they wanted. This is what they said they were going to be given. Do you think it looks the same? 
You've heard about fake news. This is fake views. <laughs> and sadly, this is just some buildings finished this year in Sweden. And to me, it's quite clear. All of these images have something in common. They lack beauty. It's ugly. It's boring. It's gray. And why does it have to be so? Why is everything so boring? Why is everything so boxy? And this is something I've been annoyed with all of my education as an architect. And lots of people agree with that. So I was part of founding this movement called Architekturupproret, or Architecture Uprising, to fight this. Because we need beauty. We want to fight ugliness and work for more beauty, to preserve our built culture heritage and not damage it. We want to work for beauty in what we build, for us, for our children, for our grandchildren, and for everything. Beauty should be something we strive for and fight for. Architecture or Architecture Uprising is actually growing a lot. It started just as a small Facebook group, but it's been a quite strong movement in a Swedish context. And these are the countries we're active in right now. And actually today, I've heard we started up a new chapter in Hungary. So if we have any Hungarians, please join. And uh, if you see your own flag, it would be nice to see you join the movement for beautiful, for beautiful architecture, beautiful cities. So what do we do then? What, what's the architecture uprising about? We mock modernism. We make jokes about this. We make sure that people talk about this. We, put this question of architecture and beauty on the agenda. So which postcard will you send from Stockholm? The one above or the new building? Or would you like a box or a castle? It's the same price tag. Or again, fake views. These are two projects. On one side, how they were sold to the public by architects, and this is how they ended up looking. We have votes especially on Facebook, but in social media, where we let our members vote for things like worst fake view of the year, or the most beautiful building, or the most ugly building. In every city or in the country, these two represent ugliest and most beautiful buildings voted by our members. And to me, it's quite clear. What people like in general is beauty, something colorful, something that has shape, something that has form, happiness, joy, not gray, blocks, and it's quite simple, but what we do is nothing new. This is from the 1930s. It's a comic strip from a newspaper. So your son is working in a box factory. Yes, he's becoming an architect. So what we do is nothing new. What's new is we brought an old question to social media, and that gave power to the public. So now we have a situation where lots of people that normally didn't talk about architecture talk about architecture. Over the dinner table, in the bus, in the car ride, people talk about architecture. People say that, I don't like that building, it's ugly. I love this one, that's beautiful. And this is something that wasn't the case 10 years ago. But it's growing as a general question in society. Equally as you talk about how large the tax is or how the healthcare is doing in a country, you could also talk about how the architecture is doing. And I think we've been part in that movement in a Swedish context. So when it comes to opinion, it's quite clear that every time there's been a statistical survey, every time we asked people, what kind of architecture do you like? Orcos did this as well. It's quite clear. Architects are wrong. The will of the people has spoken. If there were a free market, we would build in a classical style. 85% prefer classical architecture. Verdict of the people, no more boring boxes. And are we building what people really like? And I don't think so. It's quite clear. Every time you ask people in India, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Norway, in Sweden, you have the similar results. People tend to prefer traditional and classical architecture over modernist buildings. But not only that, we live in democracies, we can vote. But we can also vote with our feet because we live in economies. That means if we're willing to pay more money for something compared to something else, that's also showing our beliefs. And in a Swedish context, doesn't matter in which city, if it's a rural place or if it's a central place, if it's Stockholm, Malmö, Gothenburg or Sundsvall, People pay more for traditional architecture. And the, the difference is so clear, as this newspaper said, get one extra room in the city for free by buying an apartment in a modernist building. 
So the price difference on the market is actually one room. So you get one room extra by moving into an ugly building because people don't want that. So how come then we build so, so ugly? So Architekturreprovet, the movement, what we do is we, we try and fight this. This is just outside a new built art museum in Stockholm. The banner says, stoppa förfulningen, stop the uglification, Architekturreprovet. So we protest this and we show that we don't like this and we try and make an effort to give people in general a voice in this question. And our largest victory so far, again, Stockholm City Hall gives out the Nobel Prizes. The Nobel Committee wanted this nuclear reactor of a building in the middle of the historic center of Stockholm. We did this poster saying no thank you to the architect David Chipperfield by showing it just looks like a golden container. We don't want this, but we won. It wasn't built. <laughs> thank you. And I guess I have to thank you all as well, because I guess some of you already know this. Some of, some of you were part of this. But the moderate party in Stockholm had a quote about this, which I think is really interesting. This is something you could lose an election from, because they lost so much of the support in the areas around this project. Because people said, if you're going to support this project, we're not going to vote for you. And they lost so much support. And then the quote, this is something you could lose an election from, not win. And I think that's important. So what happened quite recently is that people in politics in Sweden started taking this question. As an example, this is from last election. Social Democrats. People don't want modernist architecture. That was a slogan for their party. A safe and beautiful Stockholm. Or no ugly high rises here. Or classical buildings in our community. This is something that I've never seen. It's something we have no historical record of, that architecture and how buildings look becomes political agenda. People in politics are waking up and listening to us because we crave something. We want this. So what I'm saying is to make architecture a matter of democracy might be a solution for modernism. But then come, if we know that people like this, we know that people want this and they're ready to pay for it, way more than for modernist stuff, then what should we build instead? And who is going to do it? So I referred to this as my greatest fear earlier, because I think we lack the knowledge of how to produce beauty, because we've forgotten how to do it. So classical architecture, what, what is that? And since this forum, and if you open the magazine of this conference, it says this is a setting for the future leader, I thought maybe, Ah, maybe I should have a small lecture about what classical architecture is. Sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me better now? Good. So, as an experiment, I have a question for, for all of you, and it starts by a timeline. So this is a timeline that starts with the pyramids of Giza, and it ends in the future, about the year 2100. So it's a timeline with buildings on it. So my question to you is, when or where on this timeline did we do classical architecture? Just imagine a red box or red tick in your head and see like where was classical? I would say this. It's a dominant general architecture ideal through most of human history. It's like 90% of the time from when we started putting rocks on top of each other until quite recent. So it's almost everything we've done so far until the 1930s when we stopped doing traditional things and bought into modernist ideas. So therefore, we've been doing this so long, and it's such a central part of what we're doing. The, the very room we're in right now, the castle we're in right now, is a classical building. So we need to know about this. So the basis, the very basis of classical architecture is what's called the post and lintel system. What's being carried and what's carrying it. Very simple. Basic from Stonehenge to every Greek temple you'll ever see to this very room we're in right now. Just look at the roof beams. This is an etching from Eisen in the 1700s. It's called the Vitruvian Hut or Birth of Architecture. What he's trying to do is explaining what is architecture? Where did architecture come from? And he depicts this as the goddess Pallas Athena pointing to those two trees with a small hut on top. 
and explaining to this angel that architecture came from nature. It's human's way of protecting from weather, rain and sun, and also covering themselves with parts of nature. And that's how architecture began. We started building things. And if you see the shape of these two tree trunks and the small hut above, it kind of reassembles the basics of a temple gable. So, of course, Eisen put parts of an Ionic Greek temple just below the arm of Pallas Athena to show that architecture comes from nature. It's human's way of living in nature. It's called the Vitruvian hut because it's based on the ideas of Vitruvius. Vitruvius was a Roman architect and he wrote the only surviving book from antiquity. And it's called Ten Books of Architecture. Vitruvius was a military man, so most of the book is about how to build ballistic missiles and uh, big firearms. But he was the first source we have, because this book was refound in the library in the 1400s. And Vitruvius is the oldest source we have for architecture. So I'm going to tell you what does he tell us about architecture. First of all, beauty derives from harmony between parts. That's proportion. Do you recognize the picture? That's Leonardo da Vinci's interpretation of what Vitruvius writes, the Vitruvian man. What is beauty? It's proportions. He also teaches the orders, the basic orders of antiquity, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. Those are the basic systems of antiquity when it comes to construct constructing temples, and those are also the basis of the basic proportion system. And finally, he teaches us how to judge architecture. He says, firmitas, utilitas, venustas, or firmness, commodity, and delight. What is sustainable, what's useful, and what's beautiful. So every time you're judging architecture, you have to ask those three questions. Will it stand the test of time? Will it stand the weather? Is it useful? Do we have any, any use for it? And is it beautiful? Those three questions should always be asked when constructing architecture. And finally, classical architecture is not a style. It's more of a language. And one has to understand that since it's not a style, it's more of a language. It can communicate with us and we can communicate with it. And using classical language can also be done in vernacular architecture by saying this is how we adapt to the weather. Like in Western Norway, where all the wood paneling go horizontal, that you can change them. Or to solve the ho housing crisis in big cities in Britain during the Industrial Revolution, to build these row houses. Or the cobbled streets of southern Italy, where the Romans left the road network and they had to build with it. And also the color schemes of the Mediterranean city, where everything's adapted to the sun. If you have dark buildings, they get way too warm, so everything's plastered white. It's adapting and using things from the local environment. That gives us vernacular, traditional vernacular architecture, which is always based on classical values. So this tells us where we are in the world. And this is a result of thousands of years of experience from people living on this place. So I would argue that experience passed down through generations, that's what culture is. And also, vernacular architecture, it's about telling us when we are home. It shows us when we arrived, telling you where you are, when you are, and what it's for. You can clearly see if it's a church, mosque, a building where you live, or a building where you work. Vernacular architecture is equally, as classical architecture, a language that speaks to us. It tells us something. Then, what is this? Where is it? Who is it for? Is it offices? Industry? Do people live here? This doesn't speak to us because we don't know this language. It's an alien language to us. And we can't really afford to lose the built environment and the cultural heritage we have within it. And all the languages we know as people for a globalist idea without beauty, without any sense of place or any humility. So it's about what we leave behind. What we build today is our gift and our inheritance to our grandchildren. And we should be grateful and thankful for everything we have around us that's built by people before us. But we should equally think about what we leave behind. Because that would be the surroundings we give to our grandchildren. And we must make sure that what we give them is the best of gifts. 
And finally, when I think about this, I think about a man called Arthur Hazelius. He founded both Skansen Museum and the Nordic Museum. So the idea was, he was afraid that the Industrial Revolution would remove the sense and understanding of culture and traditions within the society. So he founded this museum and put lots of energy into preserving and teaching people about this language, the language of culture, the language of having a civilization. And on the main entrance of this building, they carved in a granite block the quote I'm going to finalize my talk with. From fathers it came, to sons it shall go, as far as young hearts still beat in the north. From fader er kommet, till söner ska det gå, så länge unga hjärtan i Norden ännu slå. Thank you.